Sega Channel, the first interactive network offering video games on demand 24 hours a day. Now you can play up to 50 different games a month, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year for one low monthly price. I think it's very economical and it keeps my kids at home. There are more games than I've ever seen on Sega Channel. Game Pass is a revolving door of great new games that constantly flow in and out. But in an attempt to keep this video evergreen, I'm going to narrow this video's focus. So I'm only going to talk about games that either fall into one or two categories. Those either owned outright by Microsoft, or those that are on Game Pass thanks to EA Play. That way I think they all have a solid chance of staying on Game Pass, if not for good, for the foreseeable future. Also, usually I'm all about shining a spotlight on lesser known games and hidden gems. But this time around, I'm going to cover some bigger stuff. That said, I still think many of these games are often overlooked amongst the other stuff on Game Pass. Most people with Game Pass are on a constant hunt for the new stuff, glossing over anything that's been there for a while. But I firmly believe that a great game is a great game regardless of when it was released. As usual, my goal here is to shine a light on games that I like in hopes that I can nudge you to check out something that you might have otherwise skipped. But even if you've written off some of these games in the past, I hope you'd hear me out on these because some of these games are my favorite games. Not just on Game Pass, but ever. The original Crackdown is probably most well remembered for being the game that you had to buy to get access to the Halo 3 beta. And that's totally why I bought it. But it ended up becoming one of my personal favorites once the beta was over and I finally ended up playing it. In Crackdown, you play as an agent, who's basically a super soldier with a mission to bring down the crime lords of the fictional Pacific City. The thing that won me over back when I first played it, and only really has become more popular with recent open world games, is its non-linear nature. Forget rigid missions and A to B action sequences, you're in charge of your approach. You choose how you take down the crime lords using the game's mechanics. Its openness was way ahead of its time. You could sort of compare it to something like the recent Zelda games, or maybe even Elden Ring, a little bit. It's just a pure sandbox, and it has systems and tools in place that you can use to emergently solve relatively simple problems that you have at hand. You're unleashed into the city to find the roster of gang leaders who you're out to take down by any means necessary. Letting the players stumble upon their heavily fortified compounds and having the intel only then pop up is a super cool, freeing way to structure a game. Also, the player progression system is one of my favorites that I've seen. The more you engage in specific tasks, the better your skills become. Gather those agility orbs atop the city's buildings, the higher your cartoonish leaping and bounding will become. Drive more and pull off more stunts, and then your driving level goes up. That sort of thing. The game has just aged incredibly well. The cel shaded art style really has helped the game look relatively timeless. Now about its sequels. Crackdown 2 is on Game Pass 2, but let's be real, it doesn't capture the magic of the original. It got caught up in the whole zombie trend that was really big at the time, and I found it really disappointing. As for Crackdown 3, I won't give it a glowing endorsement, but it's fine, albeit weirdly brief. If you've played the first one, you might as well give it a shot since it's sitting there for no extra cost, but definitely don't play it over the first game. I think that the first Crackdown is a must play. If you want a game that doesn't hold your hand constantly and gives you an amazingly rewarding feeling of becoming stronger and more capable as you play, you gotta check it out. Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus is an absolute blast. If you've played The New Order before this one, awesome, it's a super great setup, but honestly I think you can dive right into The New Colossus and I don't think you'll be too lost. This game's story is totally wild, so much so that it's kinda hard to adequately explain. Like there's like a single moment in this game that ranks among all of the most ridiculous surreal set pieces I've ever witnessed in a game. If The New Order was something like Inglorious Bastards, well, the new Colossus cranks it up closer to something like Danger 5. <laughs> the Machine Games Wolfenstein series takes place in an alternate history where the Germans came out on top in World War II, and in this one we catch up with BJ Blazkowicz and his gang of Robo Misfits as they keep taking it to the Nazis in the most audacious ways possible. 
The voice acting here is super impressive, hitting all of the right notes, both fun and more nuanced. The game occasionally veers into deeper emotional stuff that could have easily been fumbled when mixed into such an absurd story, but it shockingly works super well. The game's got this unbeatable confidence and clear vision that makes it all come together in a really awesome way. As for the actual gameplay, it's a classic run and gun first person shooter peppered with some occasional optional stealth sequences if you were to prefer the more subtle approach. But let's be real, I'm here to unleash some serious firepower because the gameplay is beyond gratifying and I think that's helped a ton here by its super impactful sound design. This game begs to be played loudly. While the game revels in its loud and bold nature, it's also unabashedly sincere. It's a roaring declaration against fascism and authoritarianism, so if you're in the mood for an explosive in-your-face blast of fucking up some Nazis, I highly recommend Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus. Trust me, you won't regret it. Even after a decade and a half, Mirror's Edge still holds its position as the definitive first-person parkour game, with only one game maybe actually giving it a run for its money, but I'll get to that game later in this video. The world of Mirror's Edge is a futuristic city dominated by an oppressive regime that wields control over both the media and its citizens. Independent parkour couriers, known as runners, discreetly transport confidential cargo to evade the regime's attention. As a player, you step into the role of Faith, the runner who finds herself framed for a murder alongside her sister, which forces her to embark on a mission to rescue her sister and clear their names. The heart of Mirror's Edge lies in its fluid first-person movement, which is made super satisfying by its linear yet expertly crafted environments. The deliberate layout of the levels leads to an exhilarating sense of flow. But also the vibe really adds a ton too. Sleek and polished, embellished with pristine white vistas complemented by vibrant splashes of color that guide you and your momentum as you book across unsettlingly clean rooftops. Also adding to the game's atmosphere is its ethereal, angelic soundtrack and sound design. I'd say the major stain on Mirror's Edge's legacy is its gun combat sections that feel really unneeded and clunky, but fortunately I think that they're rare enough that they're easy enough to push through and forget. I think it's worth bringing up Mirror's Edge Catalyst, the long-requested sequel, but unfortunately, I think it fell short for most fans. I think that the decision to embrace an open world format is what really hurt Catalyst. It had repetitive side quests and deviated from the concise design of the first game. That said, I highly recommend the first Mirror's Edge. I think it's totally worth a shot even 15 years after its release. Deathloop is a pretty recent release from Arcane, the developers of the Dishonored series, Prey, and it's one of my favorite games I've ever played. Like definitely top 10, maybe top 5 depending on the day. It's a game with a pretty unique structure and a bit of a learning curve, but I eventually fell absolutely head over heels in love with it. In Deathloop you play as Colt, who wakes up with amnesia and for some reason he's on an island that's caught in a time loop. But while everyone else on the island seemingly blissfully resets and forgets the events of the previous loops, Going forward, Colt retains his memory and, by using this ability, uncovers plans on how to stop the loop by taking down eight different targets on the island called visionaries within the same loop. But Colt isn't uncontested, because a mysterious woman named Juliana is trying to stop him in a cat and mouse game of deception and lots and lots of murder. A distinctive 70s flair is infused into the entire game, which is a really, really great vibe. Deathloop is an immersive sim, but its time loop structure almost makes it become something else entirely. If I were to try to summarize it as basically as possible, it would be something like Hitman Bioshock with like the tiniest little bit of a dash of roguelite and I guess like Spy vs. Spy. See, it's pretty hard to boil down. The game loop of Deathloop is all about gathering information and using it to set up the perfect loop to take down all the visionaries in a single night. While you do this, you end up getting very familiar with the different locations and their different states over the course of a day, which contributes to a really in-depth understanding of this richly crafted game world. Speaking of loops, the game's time loop system resets not after every death, but after every three deaths. Which I think was a smart choice, as resetting after every death might discourage players from experimenting with the riskier and more experimental strategies that the game permits. 
There's a vast array of collectible items like different weapons, perks, trinkets that all change the gameplay quite a bit. However, the most substantial enhancements are the slabs, major abilities that you get by eliminating the visionaries. These include stuff like the ability to do a Dishonored-like blink, or force blasts from your hands that propel enemies away. While in theory a reset does erase all of your progress in weapons, this becomes less true as you progress. The discovery of the ability to infuse weapons and items with a resource called Residuum allows you to carry those over between resets, which is a really good feeling of progression. Combat in Deathloop is exciting thanks to extensive customization options that allow you to tailor Colt to your preferred playstyle. That stuff is especially useful once you take into account the multiplayer aspect of the game. Remember Juliana, the character I mentioned earlier? Players can assume the role of her during invasions, and she has many of the same abilities as Colt, as well as a few unique ones. Her objective is to stop Colt by any means necessary, it's a dynamic that provides a really fresh twist to the game. While it's optional to disable this feature in your campaign, I find the genuine Deathloop experience thrives with it enabled. But if you do find it frustrating, you can always just turn it off. The game also has some really outstanding voice performances, especially from Colt and Juliana, and the soundtrack is really great and sells the whole vibe. Deathloop is definitely a must play, and it's one of the few games that I 100%ed and still ended up going back to. I just didn't want it to end. Titanfall 2 stands out as one of the best first-person shooter campaigns from the last decade, and really, of all time. When it was released, the game was somewhat overshadowed, no thanks to its publisher EA, because it came out right alongside Call of Duty Infinite Warfare and even EA's own Battlefield 1, which didn't do it any favor sales-wise. However, the game's influence has been massive in the following years, especially on Respawn's own Apex Legends, which is set in its same universe. While I invested a ton of time in Apex, it lacks the single-player campaign that made Titanfall 2 so special. You play as Jack Cooper, who is marooned on a planet, and joins forces with BT, a Titan. Their companionship and respect of BT evolves into a touching man-and-machine connection that you might find in something like the Iron Giant. In contrast to the occasionally jingoistic stuff found in most Call of Duty campaigns, Titanfall 2 delivers straightforward, fun, sci-fi adventure with a charming flair. It's a campaign that's filled with an amazing variety of environments, and a lot of surprising set pieces. It constantly introduces cool one-off mechanics just to have the player doing something unique and cool. The campaign is still groundbreaking and would impress a first-time player to this day. Titanfall 2's gameplay was super innovative, spawning ripples of inspiration across a ton of games. The lumbering Titan sections and the fast-paced sections spent outside of BT contrast super well. The seamless blend of wall running, sliding, grappling, and breakneck speed felt super refreshing when it came out and it still feels great to this day, though many mechanics have been lifted by a bunch of games since, and they might not impact you quite as profoundly as they did me back then. One thing that many games taking inspiration from Titanfall 2 tend to overlook is how much of this game is actually a platformer. The combination of platforming and shooting is like genuinely half and half. Most games lifting from Titanfall 2 either don't have it at all, or only use it sparingly. Also, if you're an Apex player, a ton of elements in Titanfall 2 will ring familiar. Weapons, factions, and even certain characters. As for the multiplayer component of Titanfall 2, while it's great, it never was the primary draw for me. The true gem is the campaign, and I highly recommend it. Alright, and those are the 5 games on Game Pass that I think you need to give a shot if you haven't already. If you have any of your own Game Pass suggestions, please feel free to share them in the comments, and if you enjoyed this video, I've got a bunch of more other recommendation videos that I think you'll also like. If you like discovering games that you might have otherwise missed, join the 472 others and subscribe. Alright, thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.